Let's take our hymnals this morning. We're going to turn to hymn number 127. 127, wonderful grace of Jesus. Let's sing all three verses. Hymn number 127. Wonderful grace of Jesus, greater than all my sin. How shall my tongue describe it? Where shall its praise begin? Taking away my burden, setting my spirit free. For the wonderful grace of Jesus. Grace of Jesus, deeper than the mighty rolling sea, higher than the mountains, sparkling like a fountain, all sufficient grace for even me, broader than the scope of my transgression, greater far than all my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus, praise him. Wonderful grace of Jesus, preaching to all the lost. By it I have been pardoned, saved to the uttermost. Chains have been torn asunder, giving me liberty. matchless grace of Jesus, deeper than the mighty rolling sea, higher than the mountains, sparkling like a fountain, all sufficient grace for even me, broader than the scope of my transgression, greater far than all my sin and shame, oh magnify the precious name of Jesus, praise last wonderful grace of Jesus by its transforming power making him God's dear child purchasing peace at heaven for all eternity for the wonderful grace of Jesus Matchless grace of Jesus, deeper than the mighty rolling sea, higher than the mountains, sparking like a fountain, all sufficient grace for even me, broader than the scope of my transgression, greater far than all my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus, praise. Amen. Great singing. You may be seated.
Let's take our Bibles, turn to 2 Timothy, if you would please, 2 Timothy, chapter number 2, 2 Timothy, chapter number 2, you're going to find out where I am, so now I need a little bit more, we're in between, good, I'm going to begin reading in verse number 1, thou therefore my son be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier." Very few people, I think, understood spiritual warfare like the Apostle Paul. There were visible signs of that. He was thrown in jail on several occasions, beaten numerous times. He debated with the skeptics on Mars Hill, and he argued forcefully against the false teachers who were demanding that the laws of Moses would be forced upon the Gentile believers. In Lystra, he was stoned and left for dead. He was shipwrecked in Malta. And now he sat in a Roman jail basically waiting for the determination by the fickle the Caesar Nero as to whether he would live or die. And behind all of this, of course, were the forces of the devil trying to stop the spread of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, Paul, we read in our scripture reading this morning, Paul had urged Timothy back in uh, verse number 8 of chapter 1. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. He said, I don't want you, Timothy, to be ashamed. Doesn't matter whether it's the truth of Jesus Christ, whether it's the faithfulness of his servants, whether it is the suffering of his saints. Timothy, you are not to reject this, but to embrace it. Be not ashamed. And what a great challenge that is. But now Paul writes to Timothy, challenging him not to avoid his responsibilities in the battle on behalf of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, Paul desperately wanted Timothy, his son in the faith, to take his own place as a soldier of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I want to begin by asking this morning if you understand that you, yes you are also engaged in this spiritual battle. If you have been born again by the Spirit of God, you have been enlisted as a soldier of Jesus Christ. The the passing of that baton of faithfulness uh, didn't just go from Paul to Timothy, but it's gone from generation to generation, and it's been always handed down to willing believers who will deliberately determine in their hearts to live their lives for the cause of Christ, to stand for truth, to endeavor to withstand the evil that saturates our world. We as good soldiers of Jesus Christ should be very much aware of the intensifying battle that we are facing. You know, the world is filled with battles to be fought on behalf of the Lord. Soldiers are needed for the cause of Christ, and it's sometimes wondering if we're going to find any. I don't think anybody would argue today that we are in a battle for the souls of men and women. You don't realize that on our planet today, there are over 7.6 billion people 
And you wonder how many of them have even ever heard of Jesus Christ, what less have trusted him for their savior. Wednesday night, Brother Corey McTague was here and he showed his video of his time working amongst Tibetan refugees there in Kathmandu, Nepal. Now they have since relocated and are beginning that same kind of outreach. We want to have a special outreach uh, in Toronto area. The second largest refugee population of Tibetans in the world is in Toronto. But it, they had filmed, they'd gone out, and they, of course, while they were in Kathmandu, he had filmed some places and filmed some people. And through a, a, an interpreter, he had asked a man who was standing, I think, was looking like he was ready to go into a, a, a temple. And he asked him, have you ever heard of Jesus Christ? And the guy said, no, never heard of him. He did finally find out that he had heard of Christianity, but he'd never heard of Jesus. You know, I begin to think sometimes, I wonder... How many people, even in our own nation, maybe have heard the name of Jesus, but really know no truth about him or his love for this world? We are in a battle for the souls of the human race. We are also in a battle with our culture. You know, I have to admit, at times I am, I, I, I'm really taken back at the speed and the distance with which we have left the foundations upon which, really, if you think about it, Western society has built, been built. Now, certainly we cannot say that many nations are, were founded as Christian nations. But there's no way that we could ignore the biblical truths and principles that guided men and women as they built great nations like ours. And now, we're also in a battle for true biblical faith. Among those who even claim to follow Jesus Christ, there's a huge disconnect between what God tells us in his word and what they are promoting and what they are trying to do. And of course, we all have personal battles. Battles for our homes, battles in our own hearts, battles against temptation and trials, battles with the disappointments that we face as we try to live for the Lord. You know, honestly, living for God in these days and trying to be a soldier of Jesus Christ can be very, very discouraging. And yet God calls upon you and I to be soldiers, to be valiant, to be strong. And the battles can't be wished away. We can't just say, well, I don't want to deal with this. I don't want to have any part of it. No, they're going to be faced. And we can do nothing in our own ability our own strength against this adversary that comes against us. We must have something more, abundantly more. We must be empowered from on high. And that's why Paul exhorts Timothy in verse 1 of chapter 2. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we desperately need your help even this morning. And Lord, I pray that as I try to uh, expound and explore these few verses today uh, with your people, I pray that our hearts and minds would be open to you. Lord, help us to take in the truth of the word of God. And Lord, may we allow your Holy Spirit to address us personally. Lord, may we not uh, disengage, may we not uh, begin to plan our week or do other things, but Lord, may we say, you know, I've come to God's house, God has a word for me today, Lord, help me to hear it and make it real in my own life. And Lord, for this, we'll thank you once again for your word and for your Holy Spirit who indwells us and desires to teach us all things. For it's in your name we pray and ask these things. Amen. I want to talk a little bit about the ministry of God's grace. Now our theme this year, of course, is let us have grace. And at the beginning of the year, I shared with you that grace is an all-inclusive word. It speaks of undeserved favor of God toward us while we were yet sinners but it is also his ongoing supply for his children. 
Grace speaks of the, uh, of the power and the working of the Holy Spirit that are given, yes, at the moment of salvation, but it is an unlimited resource of God. It's, it's a powerful inner working of the Holy Spirit, God pouring out his favor upon us, and it provides us the strength to develop us into his image. Now, our theme was taken from Hebrews chapter 12, so I'm going to invite you to look over there. We will look at uh, several scriptures today, but I want you to turn to Hebrews chapter 12 to begin with. The last couple of verses. Verse 28, wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Now, God has promised you and I as his children a place in his kingdom, and that kingdom is not going to be moved. And again, as we've been studying the book of Revelation on Sunday nights, that we really can see that his coming is definitely very soon. But for now, we need grace to serve him with the right fashion and the right attitude and the right spirit until that kingdom is established. And this grace, dear friends, is made available to us. It is a never-ending supply, and it is sufficient for every endeavor and circumstance. Now, I discovered something about this word, let us have grace. And I got to look at it a little bit more, and I discovered that it means to hold fast, to hang on to it. So, grace is available to you and I, but... God says we need to hang on to that grace. We need to make the most of it. Well, why is that so? Well, I would say this, because grace gives renewal to the hurting. Grace gives renewal to the hurting. You ever notice how that in our times of hurt and trial and setback and disappointment, the grace of God always seems to become more real to us? You know, when the bills are piling up and when deadlines are pressing down on us, when sickness strikes, uh, when our family is in crisis, when our dreams disappear, when friendships dissolve, God is still there. Doesn't matter what you and I go through, doesn't matter how heartbreaking the circumstance, the reality is God is still there. And when nobody understands the burden that you are carrying inside, uh, God's word and God's presence remains constant and steadfast. It's like the rock in the midst of a storm. In Hebrews chapter 4, we read in verse 15, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. The last verse of that chapter says, Let us therefore come boldly, unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You know, God's presence remains steadfast like a rock in the midst of the storm and we can go to him and find the grace that we need. In chapter 13 and verse 5, he said, for he said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Now, the apostle Paul was certainly a man that is I believe, worthy of our attention, worthy of our admiration. He was a man that committed himself to uh, giving himself for others completely and without reservation. Sometimes his sacrifice was welcomed and embraced by others. Other times he was flatly rejected in his efforts by those he was trying to help. 2 Corinthians 12, 15, he said, And I will very gladly spend and be spent for you, Though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. Paul said, I'm, I'm familiar with this. I understand that even though I'm willing to give everything I can to help you and to build you and to lead you into right things, I realize that no matter how much I love you, it seems the less you love me back, but I'm not in this for that. How is it possible for Paul to keep up with spending and giving of himself for others? It was the grace of God. So grace gives renewal to those that are hurt, but it also gives resolve to the weak. Now let's go back to our text, and I want you to look at verse number 3. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 3. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier 
of Jesus Christ. Enduring hardness means going through tough times. Paul was saying, Timothy, when you suffer evil, when your efforts are not appreciated, when the care that you're trying to give out is is rejected, then it's going to take a lot of God's grace to keep pressing on. You know, God allows hardness in our lives. I, I know we think that because I'm God's child, everything should always be rosy for me. I should never experience disappointment. I should never have bad things happen to me. I should always, you know, be living the good life. But God knows that wouldn't necessarily all be good for us. You know, because hardness does something to us. It brings us to him. It draws us closer to him. You know, the reality is, is that he wants us to depend upon him. And he wants us to learn to lean more completely upon him during these hard times. Now, my wife is a pretty independent lady. She fixes things around the house. She tackles projects. Basically because she gets tired of waiting. She goes places. She does things. You know what my wife likes to tell me? One of her favorite sayings to me is this. I can do it. And she can. But sometimes, very rarely, sometimes things are beyond her. Major life things, like when she can't get a jar open. (laughs) And when she's tried time and time again, she summons me, her strong and rugged husband. And I finally get it off. And I become her hero for a couple of minutes anyway. Her strength is not enough to conquer that jar, so she needs my strength. Now, that's a very simple illustration, but you know what? God allows us to experience situations that you and I can't handle, that we're not strong enough for. God allows us to go through hard times because he knows that that hardness makes us realize that we need his strength. You ever feel like you don't know how you're going to survive another week? Yeah. I have too. More often than I care to think about. And you know I found I found that it's never enough for me to just say, well, I'm just going to, you know, dig deep inside. If you and I are going to make it through life, we must humbly admit our inability to God and cry out to him for his grace. That's what Paul did. Remember Familiar text in 2 Corinthians. He said, I had this thorn in my flesh and I kept praying to God and it was going nowhere and God just said, no, this hardness, Paul, is for you. And he went on to tell him, for my grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in mine infirmities, Paul said, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Grace gives resolve to the weak. And thirdly, I would say grace gives respect for others. You know, as you and I grow in the grace of God, we develop a sweet spirit that will make a difference in our lives and those around us. And you know, the early believers experienced that. When you go back to the book of uh, Acts, chapter number four. The book of Acts, chapter number four. We're talking about the infant days of the church there in Jerusalem. interesting situation. God doesn't call on us to do this at all times, but it certainly was at work there in Jerusalem. In verse 32, in the multitude of them that believed, notice this, were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common and with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and notice and great grace was upon them all neither was there any among them that lacked those believers said you know what I don't care who you are I want to do what I can to meet your needs and to encourage you and to uphold you and to build you up you know what I've learned down through the years that a person who has the grace of God working in their lives is able to take a 
the kind of things that come up between us can take a big issue and make it small. You ever notice that? Somebody that's really walking with the Lord, they'll take something that could be explosive and they're able to take it and let's just shrink this thing down. Is this really all that important? Let's, let's see how God would have us to handle this. But those who are graceless, they have the ability to take something small and blow it out of proportion. You know, living with grace means to treat each other with consideration and respect. And I have to tell you, it doesn't come naturally. And so we need God's grace to help us. Well, let's go back to our text. Because I want to talk about the multiplication of God's grace. Let's focus on verse number two. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. In this one verse, we find God's plan for extending the grace of God to a lost and dying world and for the continuing growth and development of God's work. It's really the heart of the Great Commission. We know the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Go ye to all the world and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. So this verse Two is really the exercise of that very thing. Now, I want you to notice, first of all, there is the receiving of the word. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses. Paul had been preaching and Paul had been teaching. And Timothy, obviously, had been listening. You say, well, that's not overly profound. Yeah, it is. He'd been paying attention. He'd been taking it in. You know, listening and receiving is a great step forward in our growth in the Lord. Hmm. There's a huge contrast given to us in the book of Ezekiel. I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and let you turn there to that. Ezekiel chapter 33. Ezekiel chapter 33. Last couple of verses. I'm going to begin in verse 30. Also, thou son of man, this is God speaking to Ezekiel, the children of thy people still are talking against thee by the walls and in the doors of the houses and speak one to another, every one to his brother saying, come, I pray you and hear what the word that cometh forth from the Lord. What is, excuse me, the word that cometh forth from the Lord? And they come unto thee as the people cometh. And they sit before thee as my people. And they will hear thy words, but they will not do them. For with their mouth they show much love, but their heart goeth after their covetousness. And lo, thou art unto them as a very lovely song of one that hath a pleasant voice and can play well on an instrument. For they hear thy words, but they do them not. And when this cometh to pass, it, lo, it will come. Then they shall know that a prophet hath been among them. So God said, you've given the message. They're not listening to you. But when the prophecy that I've given them comes to pass, they'll remember that a prophet was there with them. Hmm. Let's not underestimate the power of the word of God. And we can go back to our text to change lives. You know, God, the Holy Spirit, will use this book that you and I have in our hands to bring conviction to our hearts. God's not confused or concerned about the overpowering waves of technology and entertainment and media that sweeps our world. Because you know what? Faith cometh by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. And that's not going to change. And that's why you and I must never leave the plain and clear preaching of God's message to a lost and dying world. Now, Timothy was diligent. He said, you know, the things that thou hast heard of me, you've, you've taken these things in. And then he became a doer of the word and not a hearer only. You know, when the word of God comes to you, when you're reading your Bible on a daily basis and God, you, you, you know that God is speaking to you or when you come to church and, and the preaching from the pulpit or through the teaching of a Sunday school class, you have to ask yourself this question, am I taking this in? 
Am I genuinely receiving it? But not only is there receiving the word, but there's also then repeating the word because the verse goes on. The things that thou have heard, the same, those same things now that you've learned, Timothy, the same commit thou to faithful men. What an awesome pattern. The Holy Spirit through Paul instructs Timothy to take what he has learned and then he has said, teach it to other people, faithful men. That means men who are going to believe, Men who are going to act upon that belief. Men who are going to say, I'm going to follow through with this. I'm going to embrace this truth for myself. And then I'm going to desire to pass that truth on to others for the, of my own generation and to the next generation as well. You know, God is looking, and this is all about being a soldier of Jesus Christ. God is looking for men and women who are going to be faithful, who are going to take in this and say, I'm serious about what I believe. I'm going to go forward with it. The question is, are you a person that God can trust to pour his truth into and live it for yourself and then say, you know what? This is something that is so good and I've learned so much from it. I've benefited so much from it. I'm ready to pass it on to someone else. And that's the challenge today. To find willing-hearted people filled with God's grace who want to receive, who want to serve, who want to be counted upon. But instead, what do we find? We find ourselves so constantly wrapped up in ourselves, saying, I got to look after me and doing what makes my life better. Hmm. But in this verse also, there is the repeating of the word again. You see, the same commit thou to faithful men who, those faithful men, shall be able to teach others also. So Paul said, I've been faithful to teach and preach, Timothy. I've been faithful to preach the things of God. You have taken that in. That's good. And it's benefited your life. It's equipped you for what you needed to do. And he said, but now you need to take that same message and teach it to others. And that when they take it in and it benefits their life and they understand the power of it, that they then in turn can pass it on to someone else. Hmm. What a joy it is to see people take in the word of God with grace and see them begin to use what God has given them to serve and help others in the same way. You know what? That is really the secret to seeing a church continue to thrive from one generation to another. Do you understand that God does not intend churches to be one generation churches? God intends churches to be multi-generational assemblies. Let's go to Psalm 78. It's a great psalm. Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. God's law, the words of God's mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known. And notice, and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them, those truths from God, from their children. Showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he has done. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel when he commanded our fathers, or which he commanded our fathers, that they should make them known to their children that the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born, who should arise and declare them to their children that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. I was going to make some comments about the group. I didn't know they were singing this morning about the group of young adults that stood and sang this morning. And I was going to remind those of you that are older than they are. We'll leave it at that. What a tremendous blessing it is to see a group of young people in their 20s. These are millennials. And see them do what? See them be willing to stand up and sing for their Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, to see them here in church.
And we are very grateful for that. But I want to challenge those of you that sang and the rest of you who said, I can't sing. (laughs) If God tarries his coming, in 20 years from now, will your children be standing up here and singing? We're, we rejoice that you've heard the word of God as it's been preached and passed down, many of you from moms and dads, some of you not from moms and dads. But the question is, when some of us have moved on to heaven, will there be another generation to follow? My challenge to you is what Paul's challenge is to Timothy. The things that you've heard, the things that you've learned, the things that you've known, we've tried to not just preach but also live out, those things, are you going to take them, make them real in your life, and then are you going to pass them on to another generation who will then pass them on to another generation? I know for you, some of you haven't, marriage hasn't crossed your mind yet, and that's probably okay. But you're not thinking children and and grandchildren, but if God tarries his coming, what if? You know, there's a lot of work yet to be done if we're going to be effective in reaching our city with the gospel. The question is, where are the laborers? Where are those who are going to say, you know what, I'm going to take in all that I can so that I can multiply this word and see it go forth. Lastly, I want to share with you the motivation of God's grace. Verse 4. Let's go back to our text. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 4. No man that warreth entangleth himself, himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. God's grace will motivate us as believers to do the will of God from the heart. We are engaged in a real battle for God's truth, for the hearts of men and women to hold forth the word of life in a sin-darkened world, to build a foundation for those who will follow us. But in order for us to take on these challenges, there has to be a motivation that drives us from within. So what is your motivation? Why do you do the things that you do? Why do you live as you live? You see, we have to be motivated because our love for our Savior and the riches of His grace in our lives. You see, as I grow in His grace, that I'm driven by that grace to keep growing and to keep moving forward for Him. Now, this motivation is... I'm going to be motivated to personal holiness. Notice what it says. No man that warreth entangleth themselves with the affairs of this life. This word entangleth with the affairs of this life means to be interwoven with this world. Just a few pages over to 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 13. 1 Peter, go towards the back of your Bible if you're unfamiliar what direction to go. And then we're going to go to Titus. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And by the way, where that's written is the book of Leviticus. And if you're reading through our Bible schedule, we've been reading that book this week. Now let's go to Titus chapter 2. That's the book right after 2 Timothy. Verse 11, chapter 2, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, 
looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, if we get entangled, as he talks about, be not entangled with the affairs of this life. If we get entangled with this world and we get entangled in the things of this life, the problem is we're not able to function as a good soldier of him. The reality is you and I cannot serve two masters. It's an impossibility. If you are growing in the true grace of God, your life will be distinct. One of the things I've noticed about uh, reading through the book of uh, Leviticus, and there are a lot of interesting things. We get all the sacrifices spelled out to us and, and a lot of those things. But God said, there are certain ways that I want you to live in that land. I don't want you to live like the Egyptians did and I don't want you to live like the Canaanites did. You are my people. I have redeemed you. You are to be distinct and different, not blending in with the society around you. God desires for us to be a, a peculiar people and that doesn't mean weird people. It means unique and different. The Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. D.L. Moody, an evangelist from many years ago, said this, a holy life will make the deepest impression. Lighthouses blow no horns, they just shine. I wonder this morning how your relationship is with the world. Are you entangled in it? God calls upon his soldiers to be disentangled, ready to go at a moment's notice. A soldier that has gotten himself interwoven with the world in any way really jeopardizes his ability to serve. But I want you to notice the last part of verse 4 and then we'll be done. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. We're motivated to personal holiness, but we're also motivated to please him. God's grace will motivate us to want to make God happy. Do you ever wake up in the morning and the first thought of your day is, well, I know some of you say, preacher, you don't know what it's like when I wake up in the morning. It takes me a long time. Well, sometime in that long process, do you ever stop and say, how can I please my Savior today? That'd be a good question to post on your mirror in your bathroom or on your fridge or on your coffee pot. Some of you, that's where you go to have devotions first thing in the morning. <laughs> we do. We like coffee in the morning. How can I please my Heavenly Father today? Well, you know what? That might motivate you in the very beginning to say, well, the first thing that can please Him today is if I take time for Him this morning. That's a good way to start. How can I please him today? Well, I know certain things are going to come up through my day, and if I avoid those, well, we could just go on and on. You know, Dr. Getch is coming in a little over a week's time, and I think down through the, I think this is year 18 he's been here, but down through the years I've heard him say many times, there are only two choices on the shelf, pleasing God or pleasing self. Hmm. But notice what it says. It says that we may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Chosen by God to be a soldier. What an awesome privilege is ours. Now, I don't know about you. You ever play pickup games growing up? You know, you're going to, okay, we're going to play baseball, we're going to soccer, whatever it is, and we're going to, you know, okay, you be the captain, you be a captain, and then we all sort of line up. Don't you hate that? You're just waiting. And, and don't you love it when they pick you first? That means you're really good, right? But I'll tell you, if you get picked at all, <laughs> I've been through the sad times where, oh, it's an uneven number, you can't play. <laughs> But when we get picked, and if we get picked high enough, boy, we work really hard because we want that captain to, hey, you made the right choice to pick me. Yeah. You know what? Think of this. Out of all the universe, the God of heaven, the God who made you and redeemed you, has chosen you to be part of his army, to be a soldier. Would you be up for a promotion? 
Or would you be about ready for a dishonorable discharge? Hmm. Grace motivates me to desire to please the one who loved me and gave himself for me. I want to hear, and I think you do too, well done, thou good and faithful servant. But Paul says, Timothy, the only way any of this is going to happen, verse 1, thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Be strong in grace. You know what? You and I need his grace every day for comfort, for strength, for courage, for renewal, to press on for him. And you know what? I trust that you desire to be his instrument of grace to others in gentleness and proclaiming the gospel and encouraging others along the way. And I want God's grace to motivate me to live purely for him. Separated, yes, from the world, seeking to please him. But I have to be strong in the grace. But notice it's not my grace. It's the grace that is found in Christ Jesus. So daily and throughout each day, I have to say, Lord, I am not capable of these things. I can't endure hardness on my own as a good soldier. I cannot find the healing that I need to my hurting spirit right now. I cannot find the, the ability to take in all the word of God and, and to be anxious to pass it on to others. I can't do that. And Lord, I, I struggle with being a good soldier of Jesus Christ. The, the world wants to pull me in and, and get me off on so many other things. And so God, I have to ask you day in and day out, I need your grace. I need your favor. I need your help because I can't do it on my own. You know what? This word of God we have, we know it's, well, we saw it last week. It's God breathed. It's been given to you and I. It's an eternal book. And to you and I this morning, God's saying, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus.